second here. All right, there we go. All right, well, everyone, thanks for coming. I know that uh, it was, you know, Closing Bell is always an exciting time to have everyone here. Usually one of the great things about Closing bells, we kind of always like to bring experts coming in. We, you know, we Cyber, Cyber Expo has been a very staple of Cyber Trade University, uh, and we have been doing them a while, but now we're starting to bring them back because we know that going into this time of the year, September, October, November, you know, election year coming up, you know, everything that's happening in the market, you know, you could see the volatility, inflation. This is like the best time. Kids are back at school. Holidays are coming around the corner. We're getting a lot of great volatility in this market. You see what's happening from yesterday to today. Man, God, last week we had this big bounce, almost 1,200 points. And, you know, and we always like to bring experts in here to see and let you know a little bit about how we feel uh, and how they can contribute to your every day of trading. So, uh Don Youngchman has been a very big contributor to the markets. Um, if you haven't seen him or heard him before, just a little bit about him. He's been trading, you know, my God, just as long as I have. And, you know, once again, I've been doing it for almost 30 years. And you could see he's been doing it for 27 years. Started as a bond option trader on the board of the, uh, the stock of Chicago uh, Board of Trade. Um, he's been banking, doing more futures, options, stocks. So he basically... You know, as a floor trader and as a bond trader and worked on the pit, a lot to do similar to what I've done. He also helped manage over a quarter of $250 million to over $16 billion under management. I mean, let me tell you, when you're managing that much money, you better know what you're doing. And believe me, no one will give that much money unless you knew what you were doing. He did really well during the financial uh, crisis. And I always tell everybody this, and you know, and I know, Don, you'll probably talk about it, one of the greatest – books and the, one of the greatest movies you could watch is the big short i was actually going to watch it the other day but that has everything to do about the financial crisis just got to remember you got to watch it two or three times to really know what's going on and let me tell you you know unfortunately these catastrophes made opportunities if you have been around as long as we've been around um as in the trading we went through the not only the financial crisis hurricane sandy uh the internet bubble you know, a lot of you also been here and went through the the virus, you know, I mean, that was also another big, a big issue. But once again, if you could survive through those, you could survive through everything. So don't want to talk, take too much away from time from him. He's going to talk about about 45 minutes, tell you about his thoughts about what's happening in the market, how to perfect and help you to be a better trader, which is why we have him here. So uh, let me pass the mic over to, to him, and he'll take over. So just want to do a quick audio check. Don, do you hear me okay? Sure do, Foster. How you doing? <clears throat> I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Thanks for coming here. We're looking so forward to having you. And, you know, and the traders here are very active in the market. You know, they trade every day, some of them. Some just work part-time, just like we always tell them what to do. And just love to hear your feedback and tell them, you know, listen, you, they learn a couple of things here. It just helps them how to survive and be more successful in today's markets. Yeah. Okay. So, um, uh, yeah, you know, I'm just curious what, uh, what, what's, what's on you guys' mind and what do you, uh, what, what do you think you'd, uh, what's on top of your mind here in this market, Fausto? Well, like well, what we've been doing, I mean, one of the big things is that there, we just kind of like, there's a lot of nice little stocks and the big percentage gainers that really made some really nice movers. And, you know, regarding about, we have some nice little cheap little runners like INRX made a nice move. Uh, RBT moved pretty nicely. I mean, there's some cheap ones that we like to trade. You know, the goal, the main goal, what we try to do is, you know, if if the market's not moving like it did today, you know, we'll trade stocks that just have good volatility, good liquidity, and just make a day's pay. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, I think, um, uh, you know, I can talk to a little bit about, um, you know, the overall market conditions. I mean, the way I approach it uh, is, uh, you know, the, um, I, I do a lot, n not much day trading, right? If, it, if I make a g gain in a day and close it out, then, uh, you know, that I, I just got lucky, <laughs> 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 but you know, they're, 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 you know, they're usually, uh, a few weeks, <clears throat> you know, for, uh, you know, for, for my trades to work out. Uh, but, um, you know, we've got, uh, you know, the, the, a big part of, uh, of, of, of what I fold into my trading and I use, you know, some, I use a, a volume profile basically just to kind of time my trades and, and see when things are getting set up. Uh, but I got, uh, you know, the macro environment is, is very key 
uh, for me, kind of like, you know, let me know whether or not I just need to pass on stuff that looks like it's kind of bullish, you know, in this kind of market that we're in or, you know, vice versa. Uh, so uh, I spent a lot of effort uh, and just I've always enjoyed it, the top down macro uh, look. And so that's uh, that's a big part of my focus, um, you know, and I think maybe I mean, I suppose we could talk about, <clears throat> you, know, you know, there's certainly when you're thinking about uh, the market in broad strokes right there is a, um, um, uh, you know, a, you can't tell that it's so clear cut and talking to financial from uh, listening to financial media, you know, but I think it's more than clear. And I've been saying it for a few months now that uh, we're absolutely in a bear market um, and we're going to continue to be so uh, for quite some time. And so, you know, whenever um, I'm putting on trades or, you know, recommending trades, it's all uh, it's always with uh, the context that we're in a bear market. Right. So that means those, the, sh the rallies can be short and violent. Um, uh, and, uh, but, but, um, you know, pretty much uh, fleeting, <laughs> right? Well, well that's a good question. And that's, yeah. you know, and I, like, I like to ask you something about that because, you know, you watch the financial stations and obviously everybody's all like, you know, they're always trying to like pick the bottom, you know, and there are people like, oh, this is, this is time to buy. And I always feel like they're just like, uh, you know, followers, you know, they're not leaders. And, you know, we kind of focus on being more of a leader. We follow the orders. We use our level three, our level four. I mean, just see where the money is and which leads into like the big swing trades. And, you know, one thing that always intrigues our traders and I always like to have them on here is regarding, you know, floor traders. They don't realize that, you know, to, to be a good trader, you know, you got to be down at the pit. You got to, you know, listen, it doesn't matter what you trade. You just want to make money. But regarding about you know, you're, you're here, you are, because you sound just like me. You know, I still think that this is just all just rainbows and puppy dogs. And we're getting a little bit of a rally here, but is it really a rally? I mean, you still think it's, it's a down market? Uh, yeah, yeah, no, I, I, I very much uh, uh, do. We've got, um, you know, I, I, you know, here's all uh, I can, I got a couple things I can share on this. Um, you know, even you know if to, yeah, you just share your screen, how to share yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. No, so even if um uh even if we if you ignore right um uh, uh the geopolitical scene, right? You know, the, the massive inflationary environment that's gonna take a um uh some quite a bit of pain to alleviate. Um, you know, if you're a uh, European scene, right? Uh with, with between energy markets and who knows what else is going on, right? <clears throat> Uh, if you're going to war with Russia and Ukraine, you know, the restructuring of the global dollar block, you know, mm -hmm. uh, the, the uh, uh, that uh, all of it, if you ignored all of that, none, it's, none of that is is conducive to growth. Right. <laughs> and uh, the status quo. But even if you ignored all of that stuff and just um, uh, uh, focused on the fundamentals in the market, I'd still, we, we would be in a bear market and we would still be in a bear market. And, you know, it's really comes down to three things, <clears throat> right? And, um, uh, you know, it's, it's what we're doing is the, the bull market that we have experienced since 2008, well, 2009, um, is a, uh, in large part, right? Now, it's not that it's not the only thing, right? I mean, they did uh, shortcut the downside in the economy with everything that they did, right? I mean, instead of, but, you know, they also let losers limp along for the next 15 years, right? But, uh -huh. um, you know, they, it did help uh, uh, to keep, you know, a lot more clearing from the market. And we kind of resumed on an upward trend probably sooner than we otherwise would have, right? <clears throat> so, and there was, there's definitely been, you know, uh, growth and innovation and all that stuff driving earnings um, over the last 10 years. But most of it has been uh, led by, you know, all this consumption driving earnings. And that consumption was a result of all this massive stimulus, right, that we prop, that we uh, pumped in the economy. Uh, and that has had three big, that, that created three massive tailwinds for stocks, right? So the first thing, you, you know, you've had this you know, this mantra, and you guys have seen stuff like this, and, you know, and I'm, I'm just kind of quickly go through it. You know, here's, here we've got the monetary base of the Federal Reserve starting back in, uh, you know, going all the way back before 1960. And I've got it on a log scale, so you can actually see when there's a big change in, in magnitude, right? And for 50 years, you know, the money supply just kind of grew at a steady pace, right? And here we get into the great financial crisis. Uh, you see this, um, uh, you know, I don't know if you, you can, can you see my hourglass? You probably can't yeah. see my hourglass. Oh, you can? Yeah, oh, okay, good. So you see right here, right? So this is, um, 
when the Fed started, the, 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 the monetary base was around 800 billion at that time, right? And then we know quantitative easing and all of this, right? And look how much, look how dramatic that was in terms of, you know, from 800 billion to, you know, nearly 9 trillion, right? So, so that was nuts. Uh, and that had, uh, that, that did two, that did several things. One of them, it, it boosted consumption and earnings. And what you ended up with, uh, if you were looking at the way that people valued those early, so most, not, not only did it boost earnings, but it boosted expectations of even more earnings growth, right? Uh, and here we have the Schiller PE model, which does some adjustments and, and takes a, a, a price earnings calculations in very real terms. And it created a stock market with the second highest PE of all time, right? I mean, the, it got, it, 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 only the internet bubble uh, exceeded it. Right, and the Black Tuesday back in the um, although this is you know the, the crash in the 30s, <laughs> right? This yep. goes all the way back, you know. So 19, this, 1929. Yeah, so this the highest the the highest um, uh, PE ever, and that was you know um, uh, uh, that was a result of all that extra support and juice the markets had, right? Uh, and you know a lot of the cash that they created just went into the market in, because. The um, uh, uh, it, it sat on the uh, bank's balance sheets, but who used that? It didn't get lent out as much, but what it did uh, do is it my, found its way on the uh, prime dealer desks and uh, you know, bank's balance sheets, and they used it to prop up their prop trading, right? So, uh, there's just been a it's found its way into the market rather than into necessarily consumption, and that explains that large PE, and that's. That was a massive boost to equities. I'm sure you guys have seen the, the money supply and the equity market kind of correlations, you know, but um, uh, that's, that was very real, right? So that was that, that PE multiple expansion was one tailwind. tailwind. Uh, then you've got, you know, the, those earnings get, uh, when you look at stock price, those earnings get discounted back, right? And if you discount those earnings back at a low interest rate, those earnings are going to be worth a lot more, right? That's, that's what's been the theme, you know, ever since Volcker in the 80s, right? We've had this long, 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 long period of uh, this is the great moderation. This is the great moderation that you might hear uh, sometimes speak in the press. But after the great financial crisis, you know, we just that just continued until it couldn't go any further. Right? basically got to zero on the 10 year rate. Uh, this whole period, right, this as this thing moves down, that just means every dollar of earnings is, even, is worth even that much more. Right. So. Uh, that's another boost stock market values, and that's turned, right? Uh, and then finally, you have inflation, inflation expectations. Here is inflation expectations measured between the difference between regular bonds and uh, uh, tips, inflation protected bonds, right? So you can, you can tease out the market's expectations for inflation over different time periods. And those expectations stayed very stable you know, or low, right? I mean, they, they dramatically dropped during the great, uh, they dropped dramatically during the um, great financial crisis, but they stayed roughly around 2% or so, right? And then, of course, that's changed. Um, but it's, this assumption of stability around price, you know, that just kind of makes everybody feel good and comfortable about the purchasing power that what those earnings and dividends and all that stuff is going to be worth, what the stock price is going to be worth, right? You sell your stock, it's going to um, uh, provide more. Well, that's all been undermined, right? So now you don't no longer have uh, uh, stable inflation. You no longer have falling interest rates and you no longer get that tailwind of boosting earnings from uh, free money, right? So that's, mm -hmm. got a, that's going to reverse itself. And that's all working in reverse. And so it's those headwinds, all those tailwinds are now headwinds. And that's what the market is um, ultimately going to be is fighting against. Uh, so that's, uh, yeah, that's kind of where I think, um, and that, that, that's where I think we are. You know, I think that's what we still got to deal with. So how much, how much low, I mean, so what's going to take for it to come back? Uh, well, for those headwinds to turn around, right, you know, to, and that's, you know, we could be, you know, I, I, and when you say turn around, right, I mean, there's, there's this um, assumption that, you know, once once everything's okay in the USA, uh, the equity markets are going to go up 10, 12 percent a year on average, right? And that's what when you look at long-term expectations, and if you look at basically 
a post-World War II period, that's kind of what's, well, definitely at least from the, uh, towards the end of the 70s, you know, the 80s, 90s, you know, for this century, um, those have been rewarded, right? That, that, those kind of assumptions have been rewarded and that's mainly because, I'm sorry, it's mainly because of the great moderation, right? From Volcker, into the Volcker cramping inflation, this whole period in the Federal Reserve opportunistically lowered interest rates and, and managed inflation. Um, this, that was a, that was a 30 year process, you know, 40, I'm sorry, 40 year process. Um, and, you know, this, uh, the assumption that stocks are always going to just, once we get through this and they're off to the, to the races again, um, I don't know that we'll, we may not see that again, as long as you and I are trading. It's, it, it doesn't mean that stocks, you can't make money in stocks, uh, but this passive only, I mean, just look at all the things, right? The, the last, the 15 years, the move to passive investing has just been completely mindless, right? It, when you're investing passively, you're not paying attention to anything, right? Right. Uh, and um, uh, that's not going to be that, you know, close your eyes and buy, that's over. Uh, uh, int uh, declining, int we, we can't lower interest rates for the next 40 years, <laughs> right? Yeah. Uh, and those are um, pretty significant factors that, uh, you know, you, 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 um, you don't think about day to day, uh, but, um, you know, as you're looking, if you think about the market in terms of three, five, 10 years, uh, Japan has been going sideways for, you um, since the end of the 80s, right? Uh, most markets, there's a great book, uh, Try for the Optimists, uh, and it goes through and talks about, uh, you know, the US market and compares it to all global markets. The average return on most equity markets is three to 5%. Uh, and uh, we're, we were just in a very fortuitous window. So I don't know that we can expect 10 to 12% a year um, going forward, even after we clear out these headwinds and work through whatever, you know, overhangs that we currently have right now. Yeah, but Dom, do you think it's a whole or do you think it's just certain industries, certain, you know, certain industries and certain stocks? I mean, oh, you know, yeah, no, that's just, no, it'll be, uh, so it'll be a challenge for everyone, right? Capital will be, will be more um, harder to come by, uh, right? So projects and, and raising companies, raising capital will have to prove a higher uh, return on investment. The, the, the bar is raised on everybody for raising capital, right? Um, there, there definitely will be industries that succeed. I'm not saying the end of society. <laughs> <You know? laughs> I mean, Europe is a pretty nice place to walk around. I mean, it's, you know, the end you know, of Japan too, right? I mean, those are all developed economies, but just making money on a long only basis, expecting stocks to continue to just go up, right? You're just going to have to work for it. Just uh, everybody's going to have to work harder for it. Companies are going to have to work harder for capital. They're going to have to work harder to uh, prove it. And we, you know, investors are going to have to actually, the stock selection and, you know, trading and that sort of thing is going to, is, is, is going to be the most important thing. It wasn't, it wasn't until the seventies that passive investing was invented and it took 20 years for people to even believe it. <laughs> you know, yeah. people actually used to uh, act of worry about what they were buying every single day, you know, so. Um, well, that's why we like the day trade. We just make our money. We're done for the day. And you know yeah. what? You could, you could, I mean, there's always going to be good volatility, but yeah, I mean, when you look at some of the stocks, like even the market in general, even like in a past year or so, we haven't gone anywhere. I mean, it's really mm -hmm. been, it really on, we're making lower lows. I mean, Bloomberg just came out. We're hundred percent going into a, you know, a recession. What does it take to get into a depression? What'd you say? What does it take to get into a depression? Oh, um, well, I mean, a couple of um, uh, a couple of crises, right? And so then, you know, that's those three things were, you know, the, the, you know, I said those were happening no matter what, right? And that, that's that's putting us in a bear market. But a bear market doesn't have to be, oh my god, right? <laughs> a bear yeah. market gives it just as uh, it sucks. But um, you know, so you get um, a, uh, uh, I mean, we can paint one scenario. Um, all of this uh, natural gas volatility uh, and electricity volatility that's um, uh, pretty much bankrupting uh, energy trading companies in Europe, right? Uh, they can't, can, can you imagine what the, the, vol, uh, the, 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 the um, uh, maintenance margin, how fast that changes on something that's, you know, going up 
like it's got like 100 percent ball right right <laughs> right so i mean that's what they deal with so they say they can't uh they they can't meet their uh they can't hedge because they're not allowed to hedge because they don't have the margin anymore right uh and um you know then they go bankrupt and they have to get bailed out by uh, you know the uh, Germany or you know several there's been bailouts of a company in almost every country in Europe. Um, well, it's not like that is immune from the banking sector, right? So um, you can have like what we had in uh, in, in England with their uh, pension the the UK pension fund uh, public pension fund uh, they put on some hedges to kind of <laughs> lock in their liabilities at the highest level as they could, but you know, the hedges and those liabilities are their pension li uh, obligations. But the hedging that they did uh, was mark to market day trades, plus some structured products that banks and consultants sold them. <laughs> Sounds risky though. <laughs> yeah. But you know, that's what, um, and that's what caused the massive scare two weeks ago, right? Because they had uh, uh, that, uh, those, um, those hedges needed cash. And there's no cash in a pension plan. <laughs> right. So you can't, so, so they had to be bailed out by the Bank of England. <clears throat> uh, and, uh, you know, the, now those kind of, uh, you know, it reminds me of, you know, Bear Stearns. I don't know that how many people actually remember that Bear Stearns was a thing in 2008. I remember like yesterday, I remember trading that stock. I was in, I, I mean, some of the biggest catastrophes I remember. I, I was in, I, I was actually in Arizona doing a coaching class. One of my students, yeah. uh, went to go train him down there. And I, I mean, I'd never seen things get crushed so bad in like three days. Yeah. And he's just like, and we made a fortune on our way up on the bounce, but <laughs> that only yeah. lasts like a day. Yeah. Well, the, um, the, um, uh, uh, the, the price, you know, so they, they are lending money to the street, right? They're lending money to all the hedge funds. Right. And uh, it, all those, um, then the, every, there's one big margin call, right? They, they don't have enough money. They have to start calling in money. Everybody then has to sell things and you just get the cycle, right? So Bear Stearns was bad and it was a first indication, but it wasn't really the, the thing. People remember Lehman, right? That was, that. people remember Lehman, but Lehman was caused by Bear Stearns, right? And all the knock-on effects that, uh, that occurred from that. And so, uh, and that's when, what the, you know, the con contagion, just like the Asian financial contagion in 97, right? Uh, you had LTCM, long-term capital management. Uh, they had all these relative value arbitrages going on uh, that they thought were locked in sand. Um, and then the currency started to go the wrong way, right? You had this Asian financial crisis. LTCM went bottoms up. The Fed did its first bailout, right? <laughs> And that was that didn't that didn't end up being um, as long term, right? But those things can lead to another thing. And and you know what uh, what we have is uh, they the, they've taken the risk off the banks' balance sheets, but then now they put it on the central banks' balance sheets, right? The regular banking industry has lowered their risk from the great financial crisis, but um, you know that's sitting now on central bank balance sheets, and uh, they are in a really tough position trying to um, uh, you know, manage the inflation that they created uh, while at the same time, they've got these massive balance sheets with all this risk on it. So it could be any number of things. I would, and I wouldn't be surprised to see it start in Europe and that, and that, you know, crush, that, that takes out demand and then it becomes a self-fulfilling uh, or a self-feeding cycle on the downside. And it could be depression, you know? Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely not ruling that out of um, you know, out of the scenarios and, you know, I'm going to trade it either way. Uh, but, um, you know, as far as looking at the big picture, you know, there's a lot of, um, uh, there's a lot of stuff that got uh, funded over the last 15 years that nobody in their right mind would have funded 30 years ago, right? Because money was cheap. Right. Right. Money's cheap. And it's not going to be cheap anymore because now with the mm -hmm. rates, I mean, I've been doing this for a long time. I don't think, uh, same thing with you, Don, I don't think I've ever seen rates go up so fast the way they've gone ever well this yeah that this that, this tightening cycle is definitely uh i mean it caught you know we um my my wife's uh father passed away about a year ago right and so he had this house and we um we were you know i'm like you guys you know if we need to sell this thing let's let's get it out <laughs> you know let's move well um you know even after about one or two rate hikes Right, the price of the uh, the value of it, it, it in in terms of the, the a mortgage payment, because that's what people buy, right? They buy a mortgage, they don't buy a house, right? And so for that same dollar mortgage 
um, payment. Um, uh, the value of the house went down sixty, seventy thousand dollars, and it wasn't that much of a house <laughs> to, to begin with, you know. So, um, uh, you know, it's uh, that. Yeah, that's it's been very aggressive. You know, I think. Um, and let me show you something. Let me share something else. Um, you know, where just to and and this isn't a. I don't say this as you know a. A prediction, right? Because I'm I'm looking at things with fresh eyes every single day, right? You know, I just hey, has has it changed? Has it changed? Has it changed? I just haven't seen anything that would uh, make me think has changed a whole lot yet. But um, you know, if you look at here's the S and P. Uh, let me let me let me clear this up a little bit. Uh, here's the S and P. You know, going back ten years or so, and this is this is the the last little sellout that we've had right here. Um, now this volume profile here, this 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 is what I look at from a um, technical level, and it just happens to not that I look at it over ten years, but what it does, it tells you how much volume there has been at different levels, right? So I can we can look back and see that there was a lot more trading back at twenty one hundred on the S and P than there has been, you know, all throughout, you know, this the you know definitely the post COVID time, right? Do you guys follow me on that? Yeah, I see that. Yeah, yeah. So and then what if you look at this ten year uh, level? You know, there is uh, these, this, um, in this volume profile, there's a, a couple of numbers that are key that it calculates this point of control, which, which is where the most volume has happened here. This is at 2056. And then this value area high, which is the upper end of the 70% um, uh, of the trading, right? So 70% of the trading volume over the last 10 years happened below 2905. So think about that, right? That's, at least in the S&P 500 futures contract, right? There was uh, the, the trading of the last three years has been completely draw, uh, uh, dwarfed by the trading of the, the seven years before that, right? So that's, um, uh, uh, that's just interesting. But you, if you go back to like these 2015 highs, you look at this and then the, take this value area high, you know, that's, uh, that's 2,900 on the S&P 500. And I know at the beginning of the year, I was looking at the capital base of the S&P 500 and it's like, it equated to like $2,800, right? So basically, you know, in a, in a, in a big um, uh, cleansing uh, bear market, you trade, you, you get rid of the premiums in the stock price and you basically trade down to book value, okay? The whole market trades down close to book, right? And it's not a technically like an accounting, you know, book value, but it's, it's the capital base uh, uh, that's invested in these companies, um, which is effectively the same thing. And that number was right around 2,800. So there's a couple, you know, this 2,800, I've had my eye on this since the beginning of the year as a potential pullback area for the, um, uh, for the S&P. And that happens to coincide with roughly this upper end of this value area, yeah, um, the value area high right here. Uh, and that's that takes us back to what, 20 uh yeah what is that um 2018 but then you know there's another level here this point of control which uh you know this this would be tech, you know if I, if I was ignoring the fact that i was looking at 10 years you know and just something a little shorter term you know this is a very uh bullish pattern down here right then when you when you see this kind of pattern and it gets into it then you're like okay we've kind of really hit the bottom uh but that's that's at around 2000 on the s p um, and that corresponds to a 2015 or a, a 2015 high. Yeah. So, you know, that's, I think that's not out, you know, that's not out of the question. Uh, and what um, people don't, you know, realize was the great financial crisis, which, you know, I think we've got everything um, that what we're looking at is easily as, as severe as the great financial crisis. Um, you know, that wiped out, let me just show you here, this, so this is the, you know, 2008 going into the great financial crisis, 2007, you know, the, and this, so this was the peak 1500, which it also got at the uh, beginning at the, at the internet level, right? So it traded back up to that 1500 level, and then it traded all the way down here to 666, right? I remember just buying right. uh, EM, puts on EEM right here. <laughs> and um, the, uh, that wiped out, uh, that took us back to 96. So from 2009, uh, you know, it wiped out um, 10 to 13 years worth of stock price appreciation. Um, and I hear I'm talking, you know, roughly seven years of stock price appreciation. So 
you know, there's nothing unprecedented about it. Um, uh, and uh, certainly not even in, in terms of um, uh, percentage change, it could be pretty significant, you know? Uh, I don't know if it would exceed the great financial crisis, uh, but in terms of, um, you know, whether I'm just looking at this, the, the, the volume profile, or um, uh, looking at a couple more fundamental reasons, you know, I mean, this, this market could go quite a ways. Um, the tailwinds uh, alone that are now headwinds could take it most of the way, but if something cracks or breaks, uh, which is, you know, when you have this much uncertainty of price, nobody knows how to price, you, you, nobody can budget anything, right? No, uh, traders don't know what the um, uh, interest rates are gonna be in five, 10 years. They don't know if they're gonna be higher or lower. You know, not, not that they even know which general direction they're going, right? There's so much uncertainty out there. So um, um, if something breaks, you know, it could easily take, take it out, uh, down to those lows. Now, reg now regarding about, you know, because I see the same pattern on my end too. And that's why mm -hmm. a lot of us are very, very scared of holding any positions. But um, what would you expect to, to come out regarding in the future right now regarding about uh, is elections going to change anything? Is you know less uh, Fed the Fed uh, raising the rates less than what they expected? Or yeah. I mean, because I got the warts going on. I mean, like this, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff going on. I mean, like you having them want to change the way we do business, you know, here in the states, if it's the Green New Deal or anything like that. I mean, yeah. it's kind of changing the world. How do you think it affects certain stocks? Because it doesn't look like it's really making that big of an effect yet. Yeah, uh, what's that? The um, um, the interest rates are uh, aren't having that big of an effect yet, or what do you mean? Well, not just like like I said, there's there, there's so many moving parts that's going on right now regarding yeah. about the interest rates and stuff like that. That a lot of these traders that are out there, I mean, we, I mean, I got a couple of swings. I mean, we all have IRAs, but it's like, do we stick with dividend stocks? Do we just basically with growth stocks? I mean, mm -hmm. there are things still moving. It's just the question is. Which industries do you think we should stay away from? The high-tech stocks are ones look like they're getting killed. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, no, so I don't think from a, a like a, a sector or in, there's no, there's no cute way to own stocks through this. If it, you know, if, it, if we're in a, a bear market and something breaks, you know, there's not, there's you either, if you, if you need to hold on to them, you just hold on to them. Right. I mean, there's, there's no way to uh, be long um, uh, uh, stocks. Uh, and, um, uh, you know, not, it, it, it'll, it, there, there might some do a relative uh, basis better. Um, there could be a sector maybe that, you know, holds it, you know, it, it, it treads water or maybe even goes up a little bit, but I have no idea how to, you know, the, the macro forces that right now, this, to, to me, the macro is dominating the scene uh, and it just swamps all the other, um, I mean, you know, valuation considerations, relative value stuff, it just swamps all of that, right? And you've just got the, the macro, uh, uh, the macro picture uh, really dominating. And, um, you know, you talked about elections. I don't, the, those are, I, I put th those, that's not going to do anything. It doesn't matter who goes in the office. And we would be in basically the same place had Trump won in 2000s. And there's, there was nothing that other than, you know, maybe the, the whole Russia, Ukraine thing that may have been handled differently. But fundamentally, where we are, these things have been building up. These are the accumulation of 15 years of monetary policy mismanagement, right? And now we're dealing with it. This is 15 years of, of malinvestment, uh, which is what happens when you send the wrong price signals by keeping money artificially low. Um, and we've, we'd be working through that no matter who was in office. And it doesn't matter who gets in office next. We still have to work through all of that. Um, uh, and then, um, uh, you know, whatever else you throw on it, uh, that's, uh, we'll just see, right? Yeah, well, that, well, that's what that leads us to a question with Janice in, in the trading room just asked really quick. You think, mm -hmm. the, you think the crypto market's going to really screw up a lot of the markets? The, uh, so I think the crypto, um, uh, so crypto's got, do I think it screwed up the markets? Let me Is it going to screw up the market or did it screw up the market? Was it a factor? Um, well, it's, uh, the um, well, crypto was in large part a result of all that free money, right? You know, I talk about projects getting funded that never should have been funded, you know, right? Uh, almost all of those crypto projects just made no sense, right? It was just all hype. Um, I, you know, I'm a big believer in Bitcoin, I'm a big believer in decentralized distributed technology. 
uh, and um, you know, and 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 money and all that stuff. I have been following Bitcoin since since day one. Um, the uh, but you know they when the money run, ran out, crypto crashed. Right? Right. Cri- crypto didn't crash the market. Crypto crashed when the money ran out. Right? When the money stopped being when the, when the Fed's turned. Right? And uh, now, uh, yeah, you had a lot of leverage. So. Um, there was a lot of leverage in crypto and you saw that getting taken out one way or the other. Uh, but now it's, it's still, uh, you know, I look at primarily Bitcoin, um, but it's, it's a risk asset. It's not acting as the currency it is. Right. And so, you know, frankly, I think um, Bitcoin could get down to around 10 grand or so. It'll, it, you know, get cut in half from where it is right now. I think mm-hmm. below that level, it would look really great, but um, you know, it's just going to trade in sympathy with it. Uh, you know, uh, all other asset classes, the correlations go to one in environments like this, you know, that's why bonds are going down and stocks uh, and gold. Uh, the only thing that's going up is a dollar, right? <laughs> so, yeah. So maybe, you know, it's time to travel. Yeah. Uh, oh yeah. Neil, that's right. We're, um, um, we're looking at uh, going to my mother's from Norway. We're looking at, uh, and I'm like, well, let's just wait a little bit longer. I think we might be able to pick up tickets pretty cheap. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a one thing. I mean, but going there, I think that you was a euro dollar for dollar now. Mm-hmm. It's I mean, less, it's- right? So the euro is trading, and that's what we've been trading a lot. We've been trading, uh, uh, writing the pound down, the euro, uh, the yen, um, you know that, uh, um, and uh, gold, Bitcoin, uh, all doing those. Gold hasn't gone anywhere. I mean, I own gold forever. It's been stuck here forever. Well, it's been something to trade. I, I, we've done. Let me show you. I mean, we've been. Uh, I mean, I'm almost at the point that I want to sell all my gold. I'm getting sick of it. I had it for almost like. 10 oh, okay. years. Yeah. Well, no. So, like, if you hold on to it, I mean, that's uh, yeah. It hasn't. Uh, no. So that's just it. It's not going to respond as an inflation hedge, um, because you know the Fed is the most aggressive um, uh, bank out there, right? Um, and it, it, everybody wants the 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 U.S. economy to crash. Not only the Fed, but every other central bank, so that you know, the Fed stops putting pressure on their currencies, right? Because as they right. raise interest rates, um, that increases the attractiveness of the dollar through deposits, right? Uh, and um, relative to all other currencies. And they've been doing it the most aggressively, right? The, 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 Bank of, the Bank of England got trapped by that pension fund collapse. The Bank of Japan actually wants more inflation. They're just trying to bring it up, but, but at the same time, they don't want to see their currency fall, right? But, you know, here's what, so we did this, the Japan, we, um, and on the yen, we, uh, this, is, this is the futures, so it's an inverse quote, right, from what you're typically used to seeing on the yen. But we did, um, let me, um, the, um, uh, we've been short from, wow, way, way up here. Uh, and just trading this sucker down and somewhere, right? I think this was the intervention of maybe a couple of weeks ago that when the, uh, the, the Bank of Japan intervened and of course it just failed, right? So it just, all those interventions, all their emergency measures, uh, all that they are all just running square into inevitability and, you know, basic law of economics, which they try to, you know, they, they want to violate day in, day out. Um, and now it's, uh, it's, it's, they're getting paid, uh, they're, or they're having to pay for it. And, um, that's what, we, so we've been, yeah, we've been trading the, uh, the currencies and a lot of those, uh, in, instead of individual stocks, which, you know, I was doing most of until about June or July, and then it just turned into, uh, you know, I saw the most, the clearest opportunities in just the big macro products, whether it was individual commodities or broad market equities or currencies or that sort of thing. And, w- and what do you think your outlook is for, for silver gold in, uh, in the next three years? Because I have a Vinny that's asking for, asking about it in the room. So, uh, you know, I think over three years, I think it'll be wonderful. Um, uh, it will, uh, you know, once, once the, 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 yeah, the Bank of Japan, the Bank of England and the, um, uh, um, uh, the, the, the your ECB get taken care of, right? Once those three currencies get taken to the cleaners, you know, then the, um, uh, the, the Fed, you know, depending on when they turn, right? I don't think they're going to be as aggressive as they, uh, as they hope, right? I just think it'll be a long ways before they pivot. But once they pivot, They'll just go back to money printing and gold and everything else will be 
and it'll be on a much lower asset, a lower base of productive assets. So I think gold will be beautiful, but it could, you know, it, it, we could see a trade down to around 1200 or so. Oh, damn. Serious? What's <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, that's just my, just one man's opinion. Uh, but uh, yeah, well, let's take a look. Yeah, I, like your, I like your first answer. He said, look pretty, but pretty is look at 1200. <laughs> <laughs> well, it'll, but it'll look pretty from there. How about that? Yeah. Uh, but I mean, you know, it could go, uh, there's no, that once, once, um, once the, the, the fed is um, uh, the last man standing. Right. And they, uh, they can go back to, and they have to, and, and they have to end up bailing out the economy. Um, and that'll be, uh, really significant for Bitcoin and gold in a pos very positive for those assets. But I think we've got a long way to go before uh, they stop being weighed down by um, growth and just overall risk environment. Okay. All right. Now, does anyone else have any, any questions um, for Don in the trading room? I know Vinny did and Janice did a couple of people asking his, his expertise on Calls question: Do you think we need to get rid of the the the, the fiat currency? Oh uh, well, I mean it's, that's it, it's it's um, when we need to get rid of it, it'll it'll leave or not. <laughs> you know, it'll take care of itself. I think that um, I mean I, I think a, a better world would be a better world without uh, fiat, um, but. Um, you know, I think that uh, it, I, I think it'll, uh, uh, could very well just burn itself out. All right. You know, it just could very well burn itself out. And, um, you know, I think um, the, uh, you know, one thing I, I want to uh, chat with you guys. So, you know, this, you guys are traders, I'm traders, I'm always looking for ideas. And um, uh, one thing that, you know, I kind of, when I uh, really started uh, focusing on the, the publishing newsletter side of this, right, I'm like, all right. Uh, I need, uh, you know, I need a uh, trade a day or a, an idea day, right? Not necessarily a trade a day, but an idea day, right? So uh, we started this product um, uh, service called the Daily Pick, right? And that's where I basically make a call on either an individual stock or an ETF or, or something like that and give you the direction, how far it's going to go, stock price, all that stuff like that. But every single day I'm in there, we've been killing it. It's something like um, we closed 11 winners in one day just a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and um, uh, the um, uh, and mainly because a lot of those recommendations have been on the short side of the market, uh, uh, which is uh, feeds in the macro view. But uh, you know, it's just nine bucks a month. It's a simple service. I just give you uh, you know uh, the entry price, the ticker, you know stop loss, uh, the target price, that sort of thing. But every single day you get one, uh, and uh, it's nine bucks a month, man. It's a no brainer. And somebody just uh, dropped a note, Don. Uh, I uh, just joined yesterday. I bought your recommendation this morning and I paid for it many times over by noon. <laughs> so take that for what you will. <laughs> we went short uh, Devon Energy this morning um, and uh, that worked out. Uh, oh, but cool. uh, yeah, yeah, anyway, yeah, so that's, um, uh, th th that's one way for, you know, you guys to, if they want more trade ideas uh, for them to get, in, get to know me a little bit and uh, how I uh, look at the world. Uh, you know, they should join us nine bucks a month. It's easy. I got the details here. So, you know, if anybody wants to join me, come on over. Yeah. Nine dollars. Can't ask for too much more. I mean, it's pretty cheap, like everything else. Try everything out. Listen, I always tell all my traders, you got to try a little bit of everyone's stuff. And there's always different styles. And sometimes, you know, you find something that works best for you. So try it out and we'll go from there. So with that said, uh, Don, listen, thanks for coming. We always appreciate you and love to have you come back again and see how, you know, if you're around, uh, I know you, uh, Traders always you know, love feedback and be able to kind of benefit from it. But uh, thanks for coming and and uh, happy Halloween. <laughs> uh, yeah, positive. Hey, uh, thanks a lot, man. I appreciate you having me on and uh, enjoy the conversation. <laughs> thanks a lot. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And we'll see you next week on tra and on uh, Closing Bell again. In the meantime, we'll see you already in the morning to do some uh, live trading again. All right. Good luck, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your evening.